Next, uh, we have um, Dr. Scott Stoll. Oh my gosh, he's one of the uh, most amazing um, people that I have had the pleasure to, to meet. Um, let me just start off as well. He is board certified uh, physician specializing in sports and regenerative musculoskeletal medicine um, and is, a recognize, is recognized as an international leader in lifestyle medicine and whole food plant-based nutrition. He's a co-founder of the Plantrition Project, which you've seen them out here. Um, the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference, um, which is another conference uh, about this. Uh, the International Journal of Diabetes Reversal and Prevention and Regenerative Health Institute, as if he's not involved in enough things. A unique collaborative project with the Rodale Institute that integrates a regenerative vision of human health, agriculture, and the environment. This is cool, guys. You ready for this? He was a member of the 1994 Olympic bobsled team. How cool is that? Um, and he served as the team physician for the United States bobsled and skeleton teams in Lehigh University. Dr. Stoll served as a member of the Whole Foods Scientific and Medical Advisory Board and consults with healthcare organizations and leaders globally to integrate lifestyle medicine solutions. Please welcome Dr. Scott Stoll. Good morning. It's uh, great to be with you all. I grew up in Colorado, and uh, I live in Tennessee now, so it's nice to come back and see these gorgeous mountains, snow-capped mountains, that uh, takes me back to my childhood growing up in Colorado. This is an absolutely beautiful city and campus, and I've been honored to be here. I, uh, I want to thank Scott for inviting me. We talked about this a number of years ago, right? And, and uh, Scott worked so hard to bring this to be and, and to manifest his vision. And you know, really, his vision, my vision, and the vision of this organization, I think, is to help all of us as healthcare professionals um, find the joy of really doing what we went into medicine to do, which was to help our patients. You know, I remember when I was in my medical school interviews, as I'm sure a lot of you do, that you know, they ask, well, why do you want to do this? Because I want to help people. And I have found through the years that this lifestyle medicine is one of the greatest opportunities to help people and has brought so much joy back into the practice of medicine for me. And, uh, you know, I'll just start with a, a brief history. And I know we have an hour, and I've been doing this for 20 years, so it's really hard to, like, compress everything into an hour. Um, I think this afternoon I have three one-hour classes where we can answer more questions and have more of a dialogue. But this really started for me 20 years ago. When I was uh, new in practice, I'm a physical medicine rehab uh, physician. I was doing interventional spine and sports medicine in Pennsylvania, team doc at Lehigh University with the bobsled team. And I was seeing patients and doing what I was taught to do as a young physician. And uh, I kept hearing my patients tell me, Dr. Stoll, I'm falling apart. And so I thought, all right, well, I'm going to try and figure out what's falling apart and how to fix it with an MRI, an injection, physical therapy, some medication. And so I just kept going through, you know, month after month. And then there was a patient that sat on my exam table one day, and she said, Dr. Stoll, can you help me? I'm falling apart. And so I just asked a simple question that day. I said, what does falling apart actually mean to you? And I was like, you know, most doctors, I'm in looking at her past medical history list, medication list, trying to anticipate what the primary issue is for falling apart that I could address that day. And there was a long pause, and so I looked up, and she was starting to cry. And she said, my marriage is falling apart because my husband is just exhausted from taking care of me. Now she had my attention. Then she said, we're facing financial bankruptcy because we fell into the donut hole and it's, it's consuming our, our finances to pay for my medications. And she went on, you know, I haven't traveled to see my grandchildren in three years because they live in Washington and I can't travel across the United States. I can't attend church, I'm depressed, and my, I don't have any friends. And then she said, can you help me? So in that moment, I had this, this realization, this epiphany, that everything that I'm looking at on her past medical history list, all the tests that I've ordered, injections that I've done, hadn't really helped put her life back together again in a meaningful way. 
And I realized that the past medical history list were a bunch of diagnoses, but the most meaningful part of her life, her marriage, her faith, her grandchildren, community service, were all being eroded by these things on our past medical history list. And I had not been trained, one, to know if they were reversible, and two, how to even help her. So I left the room that day and I asked myself a question. I said, what are you going to do to help the next person that asks you for help because their life is falling apart? And it sent me on a personal learning journey. This is like 2002, 2003. And so I started to look at books and I thought, well, somebody that's written a diet book certainly has all the answers. So I read Atkins to Zone and everything in between and I was more confused than when I was finished. <laughs> High carb, low carb, cabbage soup diet, cookie diet, there was the old Lucky Strike diet, smoke more cigarettes and lose weight. Uh, and there's even the tapeworm diet. You can buy on my Amazon a pill with a tapeworm and uh, have a friend that helps consume calories during your, your day. And so I, I didn't, and the one thing I did not find in all of these books was disease reversal. You know, they had testimonies, they had bibliographies, they had studies, they had cases of people who lost 100 pounds, but nobody was consistently talking about the science of disease reversal and long-term sustainability because we all know that the research on diet sustainability is very poor. So I went back to some of my foundations, nutritional science and biochemistry in undergraduate, and I just started reading studies, looking for some kind of answer, and I found in the research that the higher the plant content of a diet, the better the health, better biochemistry, physiologically, and I said to myself, it can't be this easy, can it? So I found somebody, I was living in Pennsylvania at the time, in New Jersey, who was treating patients this way, and I went and spent some time with them, and I saw something that I had never seen or imagined possible, that patients were getting better as they aged. Discontinuing medications, pain decreasing, improved quality of life. And so we first made a decision to change in our home. I have six children. And so we made a major reversal of our diet at home because I said, you know, if this is true, then it's going to be beneficial for my family. And we saw our children's health improve pretty dramatically. And still to this day, my children, all six of them, my oldest is 25, have never had to take antibiotics for anything, never had strep throat, never had an ear infection, vibrantly healthy, hardly ever get sick. So my wife and I developed a little cookbook for my patients, and I took out my prescription pad, and I would start writing what I had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I would hand that to my patients and give them a copy of a cookbook and see them back in two weeks. And I saw nothing short of miracles in my practice, things that I never imagined possible. And so it was exciting for me as a physician to see, you know, uh, laboratory data get better, um, pain scores go down, deprescribing medications, but what was really rewarding is that my patients would come back and describe this vibrancy and health that they had never experienced before. They would say, Dr. Stoll, I haven't felt this good since I was 18 years old. And I ended up discharging patients, and I would say, I'll see you at the farmer's market. And what was really exciting is I, I gained this uh, momentum and energy inside of my practice because my staff started to see my patients getting well, my patients were happy, and so my staff members started taking on the diet changes. They would, they would pull me aside and say, what can I do, Dr. Stoll? And I have one uh, woman that um, I'm still in touch with. She was one of my assistants, and she had Crohn's disease, and she would miss work continuously because of Crohn's flares. So I worked with her, and this is now uh, 15 years later, she still is in remission, asymptomatic. It radically changed her life, um, simply because she changed what she ate. And so in the next maybe 48 minutes, I see here, we're gonna just, uh, I wanna just take you through a um, very high level summary of the power of plants. And I just wanna say before we start, this is, I'm not advocating for any named diet. I want to just tell you that our, our brains don't like absolutes or black and whites. Um, you know, if you say, I'm vegan, I'm vegetarian, for a lot of people, unless it's an ethical decision, the brain says, well, you know, I still want to have some of those foods. And we, we all know that if we have patients, there are a certain part of the patient population, if you say, don't do this, or you can't do this, they go do it anyway, because they have that, that strong will. I have one of those children, a couple of those. Um, 
So, you know, this is, I'm just simply advocating, as Scott said, plant-powered plates. And uh, I've really found that that's important for my patients to really help them see that this is, a, this is abundance. We're adding in. We're not really concentrating on taking away because we're trying to push things out. And so I just want to walk you through a high level. Um, uh, the power of plants from kind of an atomic level, we're going to talk about inflammation and free radicals, all the way to the global level. Just to understand that when we change what's on our plates, it has the potential to change just about every aspect of our lives. So I just want to, you know, just take a moment to just, you know, um, invite you to just rethink food. Because food has been shaped by our culture in a very powerful way. We all grew up, you know, I see most of you, I'm, I'll be 55 this summer, and most of us grew up in a very different food culture than we live in today. Um, we rarely ate processed food. We rarely ate fast food. We had a garden. We grew food, and we were eating more natural foods growing up. And my dad was taking oat bran and putting it in his orange juice because he thought the bran was, uh, that uh, fiber was good. So I grew up in a different environment than we do today. And today, you know, 63% of the average person's diet is processed food, and in many cases more than that. And what's interesting, too, in, in a number of surveys and consistently across all surveys, they ask people, um, how many of you believe that you're eating a healthy diet? And consistently, it's more than 80% of people believe they're eating a healthy diet because they feel like they're eating what everybody else is eating. But we've come so far in the wrong direction over the last 100 years. And so as we walk through this and as you leave this conference, I want you just to step back and rethink food. And this afternoon, I'll share some more details about how our diet has changed, but you know, just a couple of data points that we went from five pounds of sugar per person per year in 1890 to 141 pounds of sweeteners and sugars today, and four pounds of oils to 74 pounds of oils. And how many, how many calories are in a tablespoon of oil? Anybody know? 120, that's right. 120 calories per tablespoon, 4,000 calories per pound, so extremely calorie dense. And oil is in everything today. So we have radically changed the way that we eat. And sometimes it's important for us to just step back from the culture and the cultural current and say, how has food changed? And what comprises the majority of the diets today? And then to ask, what should we be putting on our plates? Because as we know, for most of us, um, the plate has changed. Not only the plate size, size of plates have changed because as Americans, we want more for our money. And they have, uh, industry has acquiesced to that to, to give us more for our money. But we've also changed the types of foods that fill our plates. From homegrown fruits and vegetables to predominantly processed foods and animals that are grown today in unnatural ways, different than animals were, gr were grown even 100 years ago. And just a question, does anybody know how many pounds of food we might eat in a year? How many pounds of food pass through our plates and fingers? Anybody guess? 2,000 pounds. The same as this little Chevy Volt. So we're eating the equivalent in weight, bumper to bumper, of a Chevy Volt. And if we think that food will not impact our health, 2,000 pounds of exposure to something that passes through our bodies every single day will have one of the most profound impacts, not only on our health, our well-being, our mental well-being, our energy and vitality today, but also our health in the future. And the, the new studies out looking at health span have found that on average, people spend the last 20% of their lives in poor health. Because 2,000 pounds a year over a lifetime passing through their body, 2,000 pounds of processed food passing through their body chronically inflames the body, wears down the system, depletes all the reserves, and begins creating injuries at multiple levels physiologically. And so that's why most people spend 20% of their lives um, struggling with their health. We also know that the plate is at the center of this incredible web around the world. The food that we eat, the food that we choose, as we'll briefly touch on today, impacts the soil that we're stewarding for future generations, agriculture, 
it impacts biodiversity of life, it impacts uh, animal well-being, it impacts economics of families, of healthcare systems, of cities, of governments. Uh, food impacts just about every part of our lives, and I think that we have lost sight of the wonder of food. And I want to um, just encourage you to just you know, we're talking about food and oftentimes we demonize food because we talk about processed food and unhealthy foods and sugar. But when we think about healthy food and when we're making good choices around healthy food, it is a wonderful, beautiful gift that God has given us, this amazing food that, we go, that goes on our plate because it has the opportunity to create life at every level when we make the right choices. And we know that because the diet has changed globally, we've seen this massive uptick in deaths related to non-communicable diseases. The non-communicable disease burden around the world is rising, and it's rising uh, most rapidly in the um, low-income countries, lower-income areas of our own country, uh, but you know, rapidly approaching you know, 74% of all deaths are related to non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases um, have a solution, which is a, lifeti- a lifestyle solution. But also importantly, and we forget this, and I, I remember this as a physiatrist because we're so focused on quality of life, but disability-adjusted life years are rising because of non-communicable diseases. One of the leading, leading causes of disability globally today is non-communicable disease, lifestyle-related diseases. And so the quality of people's lives uh, is being shortened, as is the, the duration of their lives, because of lifestyle choices that have become in, um, endemic in our culture today. And this is uh, from JAM again, showing leading causes of death and disability, uh, diet. And not dietary uh, lack, but dietary excess. Uh, above even smoking. And so all of us have come from medical school backgrounds and trainings where we did not learn about diet and nutrition. On average, medical school today spends about 19 hours educating their students about nutrition. Um, in my medical school, the nutrition was really around you know, ICU, TPN, but had nothing to do with nutrition of optimizing cellular function, disease prevention, or disease reversal. And yet, the leading cause of death and disability is diet. And so there's a real disparity in the education, I think it's delayed, uh, and the the need in healthcare to address leading cause of death and disability. And I'll talk about this later, but my organization, the Plantrition Project, uh, which is a not-for-profit designed to educate, empower, equip healthcare providers and students with the information around um, the science of nutrition for preventing and reversing disease, has created a um, uh, free platform for healthcare professional students called Plantrition University. And so we are packaging all of our materials and building courses to kind of fill in this deficit of healthcare education so that we can uh, intervene in that 19 hours and expand it and allow healthcare professional students the opportunity to learn about the science, the credible science of nutrition while they're in their uh, traditional programs. And when they come out of school, they'll be much better prepared to um, prescribe a lifestyle uh, prescription for their patients. And as I've spent so many years now looking at the science of lifestyle and um, the power of plants to transform physiology, I've just become um, enraptured by the irreducible complexity of the human body. You know, and I put this here at the beginning because the human body is miraculous. 37 trillion cells perform 37,000 billion billion chemical reactions per second. We replace 25 million cells per second. Our heart beats 35 million times per year, pumping blood through 60,000 miles of blood vessels. In one minute, 60 million chemical reactions take place to create 120,000 proteins from blueprints copied and transferred from DNA to ribosomes. Life is coordinated by 86 billion neurons and 100 trillion connections in our brains. And so, you know, the, 
This irreducible complexity and the beauty and wonder of the human body can sometimes be lost in the science that I'm going to share as we talk about food and inflammation, food and angiogenesis, food and epigenetics, food and the microbiome. But at the end of the day, there's this, this interrelated um, relationship between the food that we eat and these cells of our body that we may, may, may never fully understand or discover. And after doing this for 20 years and working with people, and I heard Dr. Taylor's rec lectures about uh, reversing diabetes, and we've, I've, I've seen this with thousands of patients. Um, we do health immersions for uh, Whole Foods Market. And we've done those for uh, 14 years, where they will identify their most unhealthy population of team members and send them to spend a week with myself, and my partner Tom, and our families. We feed them. We teach them about their, their diet, and in one week, their bodies rebound to health so quickly that we have to hire another physician to de-prescribe their medications. Because it's this beautiful, wonderful um, relationship between food and lifestyle and the complexity of our cells that, that has this miraculous response when the right food and right environment are created for the cells to heal. And this is also just a reminder, this is a, just a slide of metabolism. And some, you know, we break down Krebs cycles and we break down you know, biochemical pathways, but this always reminds me that it is far more complex than I can understand. And over the last 20 years, as I've begun to do more research, everywhere I look, I start to see that food impacts these things positively in so many different ways. And so, um, you know, I just, I just wonder at the beauty and amazing nature of food. Uh, just a quick um, story because sometimes we think of disease really impacting older people, but today it impacts young people as well. So this is Kelly. She came to one of our health immersions. She's 36 years old. And when you first met her, you would think there was nothing wrong with her. Bright, cheery, happy, working, um, ascending the, the corporate ladder at Whole Foods. But she described that she was constantly tired, depressed, overweight, um, had high blood pressure, thyroid disease, uh, felt exhausted, was suffering from infertility, and had elevated cholesterol. And when she came the first day, she pulled me aside and she said, I'm so thankful for this program because she said, every day I wake up and I don't know how I'm going to get out of bed to take care of my family. But she said, I know I have to, so I do. And so, you know, it's it's a reminder to me when I see people like this that behind the smile there's often pain. But she and her husband were really struggling because they wanted to have another child. They've been going through infer infertility um, clinics and, and really not able to have another child. Her husband was suffering for, with ulcerative colitis and actually was uh, looking at scheduling a partial colectomy for, for his um, colitis. So she spent the week with us. She went home create a sustainable lifestyle with her husband. As Dr. Taylor said, it's so important to have significant other, spouse, or partner on board. And so they did. And so here they are a couple of years later. Her husband had complete remission of his ulcerative colitis. Uh, as you can see, there's a new child there. They, the infertility was resolved and they had a new baby. Um, she looks totally different. She, all of her conditions fully resolved. She became vibrantly alive, a leader of uh, educating her community and health, and she and her husband started running 10Ks together, simply because they changed what was on their plate and they changed how they were living. And it radically transformed this family, um, the way that she interacted with her children, and her relationship with her husband. And so that's why I do what I do. I love the biochemistry, I love the science, we have a journal, we publish, we do all kinds of things, but at the end of the day, it's these kinds of stories that motivate me to continue doing what I do, because this is a family that has forever changed, because we were able to help them understand how to change their diet and how to apply it for a long uh, lifetime of health. All right, so we'll just go through this pretty quickly, because I want to leave a few minutes at the end for questions. So we're going to look through just seven lenses real quick, uh, the impact of plants on a plate. We're going to go from the biochemical to the epigenetic level, a little bit of cell biology, some complex biologic systems like the microbiome and angiogenesis, um, very high level, some randomized control trials, um, systematic reviews, meta-analyses, 
and then finish just with a highlight of the power of the plate to impact the environment. And all of this is really designed not for preve just prevention, but reversal. And I've really tried to focus on that because the prevention message is not very inspiring. You know, we've talked about prevention in our country for 80 years, and it's not a very inspiring message for patients. Reversal is inspiring for patients. Reversal is inspiring for doctors um, because we see people get better. Um, reversal, even at the environmental level, where we've lost biodiversity and we're losing topsoil because of the way we're growing food, but reversal of that is hope-filled. And so I feel like we need more hope, and so I always like to address this from a reversal standpoint and not a prevention standpoint. So we have a garden, and uh, we have weeds. Diseases are like weeds, and there are challenges, and how do you get rid of weeds? You have to pull it up from the roots. And so lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition, addresses the roots of disease. Um, and so as we're talking through this at the atomic level, we're really looking at what are the, what are the roots? Where does, where does our diet really impact our biochemistry? Where does our diet impact our cell physiology? And how does that either lead or progress to disease? Or how does our diet actually begin unwinding the injury that's occurred at the cellular level and allow our body to get back to the place where it can begin healing itself? So we all know about oxidative stress, the free radicals that cause cellular damage. There are lots of exposures from environmental exposures and toxins, uh, radiation, but food also can be a primary source of free radicals in our diet. And we all remember the, um, the science of free radicals that you know, those little free radicals um, are looking for a partner. Those electrons can rip through cell membranes, damage mitochondria, damage the DNA. And I always liken this to uh, my household with six children and socks. You know, somehow you put socks in the washing machine and they come back as a single sock. And so I get up early in the morning to go to work and I've got single blues and single blacks, but I don't have a pair. So I have to spend time now going through the entire house, looking in the laundry room, uh, looking in drawers, trying to find a match. And the same thing with these free radicals. They are looking for that partner and they're causing extensive cellular damage throughout the entire body. Um, and it's antioxidants that have free um, excess electrons to donate to bring that stabilization. But one, another way that um, these free radicals are created are things like endotoxins. So endotoxins can, are, can be a part of food from a number of different um, uh, substrates, and one of those is the covering on the outside of bacteria that is heat stable. So even after we cook food, um, we cook meat products, some of those endotoxins can find their way into our system. This was an interesting um, trial where they injected people with endotoxins and exposed them to the same level of endotoxin that you would get in your diet. And it's interesting for a number of reasons. One, because there's an acute inflammatory response, and we can see that with the inflammatory markers, IL-6 and TNF-alpha, that within two hours, there's an inflammatory spike. And that correlates with other research that shows us within two to three hours of eating food, there is either a reduction in inflammation or an increase in inflammation in our body at every level. And so what's interesting here is that there's a correlation with social disconnection and depression also, likely because of the neuroinflammation that occurs um, after this, this exposure. And so we see that you know, between two and three hours, there's this increase in people feeling socially disconnected and depressed. This also occurs in similar um, uh, processed foods and sugar foods where we have spikes two to four hours. And if we think about the average diet of the American today, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, five exposures to inflammatory foods, they spend most of their day in a chronically inflamed state. And not just inflamed you know, at the cellular level, but inflamed inside of their brains, neuroinflammation at the microglial level. Uh, and there have been a number of studies that have shown that this inflammation has a direct impact on mood, both depression and anxiety, uh, and school performance. And so many of these uh, our young people may struggle in school because it was breakfast, lunch, and dinner, not necessarily a medical diagnosis that is, that is impacting their ability to pay attention and learn in school. 
<clears throat> There's been an interesting um, research marker called Dietary Inflammation Index, and they've found that um, higher dietary inflammation index is associated now with 27 diseases, that as we eat foods, and you can see in the blue there the foods that are more infl inflammatory, <clears throat> that it drives a chronic inflamed state inside of the body, and it's related to nearly all the diseases that, that we see in our clinics on a daily basis. Something I was never taught in medical school or residency was the origin of disease. What's the root? We understood some of the, you know, the receptor level uh, issues of disease, some of the, um, you know, descriptions of injury, but we didn't really understand the roots of these diseases, and so much of the root goes back to the food on our plates and the lifestyle choices that we're making on a daily basis. But the Dietary Inflammation Index also shows that when people switch to a plate full of plants, it is loaded with anti-inflammatory potential that lowers the Dietary Inflammation Index. And with it, the risk for these diseases, and as we'll see later, the opportunity to send many of these diseases into remission or significant improvement at the very least. There's also research to show that the polyphenols, those um, chemicals that bring the color and vibrancy of plants, strawberries and blackberries, the greens in a beautiful kale salad, um, have the impact on scavenging uh, free radicals, on stabilizing the microbiome, uh, which also improves the inflammatory state of the body. And they have an anti-inflammatory effect and detoxification effect. Um, and you can see the pathway there, or the pathways by which these polyphenols um, directly reduce uh, inflammation in the body. And so these are those polyphenols, <clears throat> the bright, life-filled um, color fruits and vegetables. And if we think about this in contrast to the food that most people eat today, which is what color? Browns, whites, right? And they have to, uh, they have to put color in the package because the food is colorless. And they know that our eyes are attracted to color, so they fill the packages with yellows and reds and different colors because the food is lifeless and colorless. When in reality, the food that we should be eating is filled with color, and it's those polyphenols, the antioxidants and the phytochemicals that are having this incredible impact throughout our body. And it creates beautiful meals like this. And there have been a lot of misconceptions about plant-based food. My patients would say, Dr. Stoll, I'm never gonna eat twigs and sticks like you. Uh, I'd say, I don't eat twigs and sticks. I eat beautiful, vibrant, delicious meals. I enjoy my food more than I ever did. And uh, you know, they have this misconception that I'm asking them to eat a plate full of salad, when in reality, it's the most delicious food that I've ever enjoyed. It's abundant. I eat till I'm absolutely full. And um, I, I enjoy food uh, at a much higher level than I ever did before. And it's this beautiful, vibrant food with more flavors than the average standard American diet today. So let's just talk a little bit about epigenetics. It's this amazing field um, that is continuing to show us that the lifestyle choices we make today, the environmental exposures that occurred even in our grandparents, have an impact on our genetic susceptibilities. And it is, it's such a fantastic field, and I wish we could talk about this the entire day. Um, even the level of stress, that mothers who were stressed during pregnancy have babies that are born with a higher set point of cortisol and a more rapid uh, spike of cortisol when they experience stress, simply because their mother was stressed. And the same with diet, that um, grandparents who had a healthy diet helped to establish greater disease resistance in their grandchildren because it's getting wired into their epigenome. And this is just a study that reminds us, a study shows that 90% um, of the diseases today are not genetically oriented. And we all know that, it's predominantly lifestyle. It's this relationship between the epigenetic susceptibility that came from our grandparents and our parents in combination to our lifestyle cho choices and exposures of today. And so we can basically turn on and turn off these epigenetic markers with choices that we're making in a very short period of time. The science of epi the um, epigenome is showing that there's an epigenetic shift that can occur um, that, can sh that can bend the curve in aging. And things like polyphenols that we talked about earlier that reduce inflammation, they, they also can suppress enzyme activity 
and activate epi epigenetically silenced genes that are important in uh, activity, cellular activities like detoxification, like glutathione, that can help to um, improve the body's ability to ward off uh, cellular injury, inflammation, and uh, heal the DNA. And you can see along that pathway all the different areas where the um, polyphenols, the sulforaphane, which is a phytochemical from broccoli, can even normalize DNA methylation. So bite by bite, we are reducing inflammation. We are improving our epigenetic, um, uh, uh, our epigenetic uh, profile in such a way that it is improving our health today, protecting us in the future. And for parents that are of childbearing age, they are actually wiring in health for their children as they're eating their meals on a daily basis. This is some research from Dr. Dean Ornish, um, and this comes out of a study that he did on low-grade prostate cancer, where they, um, uh, they took a group of patients with grade one, grade two prostate cancer and entered them into a trial uh, utilizing a whole food plant-based diet, stress reduction, uh, exercise, and strong community support. And they were the first to show that in just 12 weeks, they could positively impact more than 500 genes, switching off 48 uh, are switching off 453 oncogenes and turning on 48 genes that are involved in cancer protection. Um, and they also showed for the first time that their lifestyle intervention had a positive impact on telomeres and telomerase, increasing telomerase activity by 30%, which maintains the health of the telomere. And that they actually showed a lengthening of those telomeres at the end of 12 weeks. So it's a very hopeful message that uh, I love to share with patients because it tells us that we're actually at the DNA level, at the chromosomal level, seeing changes in their body in just 12 weeks time. And we know that lifestyle um, has this, this um, unhealthy lifestyle and, positive and a healthy lifestyle can turn on and turn off these switches. Um, here are some inflammatory switches. Uh, IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, and IL-6 <clears throat> that are turned on by these uh, unhealthy lifestyle choices. But also we see in the research that healthy lifestyle choices, phytochemicals, and then uh, I'll talk about butyrate in a second, um, can switch off this key switch of NF-kappa beta that's involved in a, uh, turning on 400 different genes in the inflammatory cascade. So as people are eating a healthy meal at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, their body is switching off these key pathways like NF-kappa beta that are driving inflammatory, uh, that would be driving inflammation systemically, and instead it's bringing kind of a quiet and a calm to the inflammatory system. But the plants go much further than just the direct impact of the polyphenols and phytochemicals turning off the genes. The fiber that's in the plants is processed by the microbiome, and as the microbiome processes the fiber, it produces the secondary byproducts, short-chain fatty acids like butyrate. Butyrate circulates throughout the body and has this profound impact on a number of dis different systems. Uh, one of those is actually to circle back and turn off NF-kappa beta. So there's this, uh, there's multiplicity of impact of the food that we're eating on our systems. Um, here's some more um, evidence again on butyrate, the short-chain fatty acid that's produced by the microbiome uh, impacting the epigenome. And we can see that the butyrate <clears throat> has the um, uh, opportunity to downregulate the expression of VEGF. And VEGF is one of those key steps we'll talk about in a minute with uh, angiogenesis that grows blood vessels into cancer cells supplying them with all the food they need uh, to continue to grow rapidly, as well as an opportunity for metastasis into the system. And there's been a lot of research on angiogenesis, as many of you know, showing that if we can stop the angiogenesis cycle, um, it blunts the growth of cancer. And so um, the polyphenols, uh, through via butyrate, reduce that expression of VEGF. There's an anti-inflammatory effect um, via reductions of NF-kappa beta, like we talked about, it inhibits mTOR system. It has an impact on insulin resistance and obesity via the PGC1 alpha gene. 
an effect on cardiovascular disease, downregulating nine genes uh, of intestinal cholesterol biosynthesis and G1 cell cycle proteins, uh, has neuroprotective effect, upregulating BDNF, just like exercise would as well, has immune system effect by um, inducing macrophage differentiation, and it activates stem cells. In fact, there's research to show that a serving of broccoli will, will activate the mesenchymal stem cells of our bone marrow to begin circulating in our bodies and repairing um, tissue. So kind of moving up to the next level, looking at cell function, uh, Plant-based diets and the research have shown that um, mitochondrial efficiency is dramatically improved through a whole food plant-based diet. And not just efficiency, but there's also a biogenesis, the production of more mitochondria. And this is one of the reasons why we see more and more, especially endurance athletes, shifting to a whole food plant-based diet because they actually believe that it is a, um, it's a great enhancement to their performance. You know, they're not taking performance-enhancing drugs, they're using a performance-enhancing diet. And, you know, across the spectrum, from Olympic athletes to NBA athletes to even NFL athletes, we're, we're seeing more and more athletes recognize the benefit of a plant-based diet. And part of it is the mitochondrial efficiency that they're experiencing. Delayed onset muscle soreness is reduced by 50%. Instead of 48 hours, it's 24 hours. So there's a faster muscle recovery, there's faster repair of the micro uh, injury, there's lower post-exercise inflammation levels uh, that are found in athletes, and so there truly is um, a performance enhancement that comes through a dietary shift. Um, this is just a summary of some studies. Um, uh, we see cellular op optimization of plants through the reduction of intermycellular lipid, as Dr. Taylor was talking about earlier, uh, both in the muscle, in the uh, liver, and in the pancreas. We see reduced IGF-1 levels. Um, elevated IGF-1 levels are also associated with increased cancer rates, and so we see a normalization of IGF-1 levels in people on plants. Normalized leptin and adiponectin, which also balances appetite. Uh, fat storage, reduced mTOR, as we've talked about, inhibit microglia, uh, mediated neuroinflammation, uh, which improves mood. And a lot of studies that have looked at um, even workers um, have found that mood and presenteeism improve in people when they have a plant-based diet. Optimizes NRF2 and protects against oxidative stress and cancer. Increased production of nitric oxide, opening up those beautiful blood vessels to lower blood pressure, um, all via a plant-powered plate. Uh, briefly, some complex biologic systems. First, the microbiome, one of the most wonderful systems that we uh, marvel at but still don't understand uh, very much about at this point in time. But we do know that this microbiome that we inherit from our parents that's impacted by our culture um, is, is directly influenced by lots of different things. Um, inactivity influences the, the um, types of bacteria that predominate inside of that microbiome. Uh, women that have C-sections have babies that have lower um, microbiomes that can take up to a year to catch up. Formula feeding, because when mother is breastfeeding, some of her microbiome is, is released into the mother's milk and finds its way in to seed the baby's microbiome. Uh, sleep deprivation is a stress that changes the microbiome. Antibiotics uh, dramatically impact um, the microbiome, and sometimes it can take up to a year for the microbiome to recover after a series of antibiotics. The Western diet, as we'll talk about in a minute, and st stress, chronic stress. And so when the microbiome is unhealthy, there are um, types of bacteria that can predominate that produce secondary molecules. One of those molecules is TMAO. Have you, how many of you have heard of TMAO? So not too many. So trimethylene uh, oxide is actually produced by some of the bacteria in the microbiome in direct response to an unhealthy diet. Um, and it appears to be the carnitine and the choline in the diet. Carnitine coming from where and choline? Predominantly animal products. And so this is part of the reason, I, you know, one of the many reasons why we see in the literature that when somebody eats more than 10% of their diet from animal products, there's a slow increase 
uh, in disease susceptibility. And some of it may be related to the microbiome. <clears throat> so the bacteria are producing trimethylene oxide. Um, it's released um, into the bloodstream and it finds its way down into the uh, endothelial cells of the, um, of the blood vessels. Um, it finds its way into the, um, the cells, creating inflammation, disrupting uh, insulin, normal insulin signaling, creating uh, insulin resistance. Finds its way into joints, the brain. Uh, it's related to kidney disease, heart disease, stroke risk, um, and a number of other inflammatory conditions. And TMAO can be um, increased or decreased simply by changing the diet. And what's interesting, they, they did a study with um, uh, vegans and uh, omnivores. And they fed the vegans an animal-based diet and found that their bodies did not produce any TMAO when they were given meat because they didn't have the bacteria inside of their microbiome to produce TMAO. And when they gave the, um, the omnivores a vegan diet, their um, TMAO numbers reduced substantially even in just 24 hours. So it shows us this incredible dynamic of diet that's going on day to day with the food that we're eating and the relationship to systems such as our microbiome. And so this is just a, another study from a, a, re, a review of 188 studies that showed that a high fat diet, high fat predominantly coming from you know, higher animal product exposure, uh, reduces several types of bacteria that are associated um, with metabolic, uh, with metab healthy metabolic states. So we're reducing the um, bacteria that are helping to stabilize a healthy me uh, met metabolism inside the human body. But we can also see with plant-based proteins, there's a predominance of um, bifidobacteria, the lactobacillus, which reduce the uh, TMAO production and increase short-chain fatty acid production thereby, as we saw, reducing overall systemic inflammation. And just the opposite is true when people are eating more animal-based products. And then again, this is just a, a slide to highlight the fact that as someone shifts from a healthy diet to an at-risk diet, um, that there's dramatic changes inside of their microbiome and even the, the lining around those uh, colonocytes that are important in protecting uh, the colon. Uh, the tight junctions that are important in regulating uh, and, pro and protecting the absorption of um, food molecules can become inflamed and begin separating uh, with an inflammatory-based diet. Uh, very briefly about angiogenesis, you know, it's this beautiful system inside of our body where we have this balance of um, growing blood vessels into injured cells and then decreasing the growth of those blood vessels when the, when the uh, injury has been resolved. But when that system is out of balance, we can get excessive growth in some conditions like cancer, psoriasis, arthritis, and we can get insufficient growth as we see here in chronic wound healing. And it's really moderated um, essentially by our lifestyle. Uh, there's research to show that anthocyanins and phenolics, these polyphenols and phytochemicals that create the beautiful colors of these berries, again, inhibit VEGF and the migration of endothelial cells and exert an anti-inflammatory and anti-angiogenic effect. So when somebody sprinkles blueberries on their oatmeal in the morning, they, I always encourage them, you are powering up your endothelial cells and you're improving the blood supply to your body and you're balancing your angiogenesis system. Uh, my friend, Dr. William Lee, who um, started the Angiogenesis Foundation, worked with a number of universities to look at the foods that optimize angiogenesis, that, that bring balance to the system. And this is the, these are the foods that they found that normalize the angiogenesis system. And it's basically many of the foods that you've eating, been eating, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and the foods that can create this incredible um, uh, wide spectrum of delicious meals. So just to highlight a few randomized control trials, um, this is just a summary that there was greater sustained weight loss in groups at one and two years, improved beta cell function, as Dr. Taylor was talking about, insulin sensitivity, improved cholesterol and lipid levels, depression, anxiety scores, peripheral neuropathy, um, significant improvements in peripheral neuropathy, and I've, I've treated that for many years, and diet is the best way to intervene, especially in severe 
um, peripheral neuropathy, it can be improved in just two weeks, you can change somebody's life. Ulcerative colitis, we see significant change, um, and uh, patients um, showed significant improvement in just 12 weeks. So it's a short-term intervention. This is a, a diabetes study, 24 weeks, randomized control trial, looking at um, vegetarian diet versus the American Diabetes Association diet. And we can see in the experimental group, they had this amazing improvement, not only in medications, weight, and uh, insulin sensitivity, but the adiponectin improved, <clears throat> leptin went down, so their, their hunger signals are gonna be suppressed. Um, they had a loss of visceral and subcutaneous fat, um, vitamin C and superoxide dismutase went up because they were less inflamed. They had improved reduced glutathione because their body was less inflamed, so they had more glutathione to, to man manage and mitigate the inflammatory uh, exposures that they might encounter. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Dean Ornish and several others have done studies looking at the reversal of heart disease. Um, here are a couple of uh, angiograms uh, showing that in 12 to 18 months, there's a dramatic improvement in uh, blood, blood flow. This is the LAD, uh, actually in a patient from Dr. Esselstyn, who is a cardiologist down the hallway, uh, who didn't really believe in the power of diet until he himself suffered a heart attack and didn't really want a stent, so he put himself on the diet and 18 months transforms his life. Um, and this is also cardiac perfusion at the bottom, uh, showing significant improvement in cardiac uh, perfusion in just three months uh, on a plant-based diet. Dr. Dean Ornish did the life cell heart trial over one year, showing 91% regression in angina uh, versus the American Heart Association diet, which showed a 165% increase in angina, and then reperfusion here in just three weeks, um, with greater improvement in five years versus one year. Here's just a summary uh, that you can take a picture of if you want to, looking at uh, hyperlipidemia and all the uh, randomized control trials that have been done um, showing substantial reductions in lipids uh, with intervention using uh, plant-based diets. And then, um, again, here's another systematic review showing plant-based diets accompanied by educational intervention significantly improve psychological health, quality of life, A1C levels, and weight and therefore uh, diabetes. All right, so real quick, we're nearing the end, so we're gonna go through um, just some systematic reviews and meta-analyses again, just to highlight the, at the bigger picture level, more of a population level, that a plant-powered plate has a, a significant impact. So um, there, these are a couple of studies that showed uh, that dietary recommendations to increase fruit and vegetable intake um, Beyond the five of day, uh, which actually goes up to 10 fruits and serving, 10 servings of fruits or vegetables per day, is uh, beneficial for coronary artery disease and mortality from stroke. <clears throat> so we know that 90% of people are aware that they should eat five per day. Uh, how many, what percent of people are actually eating five per day? 12% <clears throat> at best. So there's a huge awareness globally <clears throat> but nobody's doing it. And actually the research here and in this next one are showing that ideally for cardiovascular risk should be 10 servings of fruits or vegetables per day, which is a really big plant-based plate. But look at the reduction in deaths globally. 7.8 million deaths could be prevented every year as people shift towards a plant-based plate. That is substantial. Um, that's a great opportunity for us to intervene and really help people. Um, here's looking at uh, hazard ratios and fruit and vegetable consumption. And again, it just shows us that all-cause mortality gets better the closer we get to 10 servings of fruits or vegetables. And so it's an encourage, encouragement for all of us to add more to our plate. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, the, so the broad study was done by some friends of ours down in New Zealand, and this was a one-year study uh, without any exercise. And they showed that um, not only BMI, cholesterol, and other risk factors improved, but they had a greater sustained weight loss at six and 12 months, more than any other trial that did not limit energy intake or mandate exercise. They simply encouraged and taught people how to eat a plant-based plate. And so uh, this is encouraging for lots of people that are not gonna go back out into the world and be extremely uh, religious about exercise, but simply shows us that when people switch to a plant-based plate, 
things do get better, even if they're not limiting their energy intake. Uh, from JAMA, again, high animal in, uh, protein intake was positively associated with cardiovascular disease and high plant intake, inversely associated with all-cause and cardiovascular mortality, especially among individuals with at least one lifestyle risk factor. Um, this one on obesity-related inflammatory profiles, systematic review and meta-analysis. Plant-based diets are associated with improvement in obesity-related inflammatory profiles and could provide means for therapy and prevention of chronic disease risk. Um, and I love this one. I love the title, Let Us Be Happy. So <laughs> it's a great title for a study. And uh, I love this study, too, because it shows that mental well-being responded in a dose-response fashion to increases both in the quantity and frequency of fruits and vegetables consumed. So again, more is better. More of these beautiful foods. So in the last couple of minutes, just again to talk about the food system and how the food system is, can be dramatically improved as more people shift to a plant-based plate. So this is just simply to say that animal agriculture is not the same as it was 100 years ago. Um, and because it's not the same, uh, it produces a lot of secondary consequences. Many, some environmental consequences like the dead zones and the oceans. Um, but this one for us, which is directly um, related to the care of patients, which is antibiotic drug use on our animal farms. More than 80% of the antibiotics that are produced are used in animal agriculture. Initially, they were used to facilitate growth of animals. Uh, they're still used today because we confine animals in these tight spaces and the animals get sick, so they use them frequently, and it develops in, uh, uh, antibiotic resistance that is transferred throughout the system. <clears throat> and so one of the leading causes today of antibiotic resistance <clears throat> is not the physician's uh, prescription pad, rather it's the food system and the production of animals that's driving antibiotic resistance. And so as we shift to more plants, we drive a change in the way that uh, animals are cared for and produced uh, upstream. We look at resource and sustainability, knowing that we're all moving towards 10 billion people globally. Um, the vegan diet or whole food plant-based diet had the highest scores both on health and resource sustainability, water, land use, et cetera. Um, again, this is from 2023, looking at um, all of the resources uh, needed for um, the production of food for 10 billion people, and the vegan diet scored the lowest across all indicators. Although water required for plant-based protein nearly offset other water gains, for the omnivore diets, red meat and dairy contributed to the most um, in each environmental indicator. By considering sustainability as well as health, health outcomes and the recommendations, the dietary guidelines, USDA can have a critical role in shifting diets um, to improve the health of our environment and resources. Uh, Eat Lancet 2019, Dr. Walter Willett, said really that we need to shift at least half of our consumption to fruits and vegetables, uh, reducing from animal products just from, from an environmental uh, sustainability standpoint. And so that's a lot in an hour. And, uh, but you know, I, I hope it just gives you a flavor that as we begin shifting our plates, as we begin encouraging our patients to shift their plates, that they will see a radical transformation in their health at every level of their cellular physiology, that it optimizes the biochemistry of their cells, and that in doing so, it improves the quality of their life. It improves the way they feel every day. They get up in the morning and they feel better. They have greater vitality. They can be more present for spouses, children, grandchildren. They don't have to call us with uh, as many issues. We get to de-prescribe instead of add medications. Um, it really is a radical transformation of their lives. And Stephen Covey said this, um, to learn and not to do is really not to learn, to know and not to do is really not to know. And so it's my sincere hope that after hearing this information that you'll be able to take it and process it, that you can engage with um, our organizations uh, such as the Plantrition Project. <clears throat> we have resources out here. We have an annual conference every year for physicians um, that is a fantastic three days. We serve amazing food. We have um, you know, somewhere between 750 people and 1,000 people from 40 countries that come, healthcare providers, to meet and learn and share and encourage one another. 
Uh, we have a wonderful free journal, the IJR, IJDRP. So you can log on and sign up for free, International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. We're always looking for new article submissions, but it's a, it's a great way to continue your education and understanding the opportunities to reverse disease through lifestyle. Um, we have uh, Plantrition Providers, which is a wonderful um, website. I know a number of people have asked, where can I get started? Uh, Plantrition Providers is a, a site that we've created for providers that has education. All of the lectures that have ever been done, 10 years of our conferences are available there. We're creating a get started now, uh, kind of learning opportunity inside of providers. Um, and there's a listing opportunity to list yourself as a, a provider that can help patients um, on this journey of lifestyle. Uh, we also have quick start guides that are free for patients that can be downloaded in a number of languages, including Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, um, and Arabic. And so those are available on our website for free that you can share with your patients. So I uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'll be here for uh, three hours this afternoon. I'd love to take questions and, and have a dialogue with you during those, that time. So Scott, come on up.